I am Shusara Konakumara. Welcome to Satsang. You are beginningless. You are endless. You are divine. Good evening. This is Shisara Konokumara, joined by PLAN and our uh, Shambhala Center Core Council members, uh, Tim, Linda, and Megan. We're all with you tonight for satsang. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's go ahead and uh, take a deep breath. Call yourselves forward, and we'll clear the space. Mother, Father, God that I am, through the great central sun hierarchy, through the office of the Christ, through the order of Melchizedek, I call upon Archangel Michael to bring the sapphire blue ray. Cut away, cut away, cut away anything in all of our four lower vehicles not emanating directly from our I am presence. I now call on Archangel Zekiel, keeper of the violet flame. Blaze, blaze, blaze the violet flame through all of our four bodies. Transmute, transmute, transmute all the psychic debris Michael has cut free. I now bring forth the invincible ring pass knot and the mirror blue light of invisibility to completely surround each of us. And I call forth a shaft of pure Christ light, one to surround each one of us listening. And I ask that they be brought to the center of the earth where I call on Archangel Gabriel to seal them. And I ask that the legions of Michael completely surround each tube of light. And now I ask that our vibrations be raised high above the psychic and astral worlds to the highest realm of illumined truth we each can attain at this time. Now, Mother, Father, God, we place ourselves in service to you and to humanity. And PLN and I place ourselves in service to all of you tonight. We ask that only that which is direct from you be permitted into our perceptions and all else of the lower mind be kept out. And we ask that only that which is direct from you be permitted through us. And because we have asked this, we consider it so. So be it. you just stay where you are for a moment let's do just a little bit of service work take a nice deep breath place yourself in service to humanity ask to be used as a vessel at this time let's call on Archangel Zekiel and Saint Germain to bring the Uh, dispensation of the violet flame in and allow it to be used through our physical vessels to help lift and transmute any disqualified energies that are within our um, sphere of reference anything that we can use our own energies to transmute let's just go ahead and volunteer to do that at this time take nice three good deep breaths and just allow whatever wants to come to come And I will uh, hit my little gong here for each one of those breaths, okay? Here we go.
very good. I remember every time you do this to uh, do this in a space of gratitude. You know, we're actually quite gifted just to be here, um, much less to be consciously working in service. It is a gift. And for as challenging as it can be for those of us who do get challenged on a physical level um, concerning being of service, it is still an amazing gift uh, and a beautiful opportunity for all of us. So allow yourself just to be in gratitude for going through the exercise and taking the time to do what you have done tonight. And thank you for that. All right. So, is there anything specifically that, um, PLN, was there anything we missed last week or anything we need to come back to that you're aware of? And I'll ask the group too if there's anything that. Sorry, my computer. <laughs> She's having technical issues tonight. <laughs> it doesn't really want to listen to me. Okay, so I have here um, the program can stop running. It's your attachment that keeps it running <laughs> or anchor points. <clears throat> and let's see. You know, I can make myself these notes that I think are so clear at the time. <laughs> <laughs> And then a week later, I'm like, what was I talking about? <laughs> I think we were talking about, um, let's see. So oh, you were, were going over the, um, the Byron Katie quote. Yes. Okay. Which we don't really need to revisit in its entirety. I think we really covered it quite well. But I will say what I, what I think you're pointing to is just that um, the concept that still sits there with uh, people on their conscious journeys is that it, the, it, there's, some, there's some point that they're striving to reach where at that point, you know, the program of self just stops, right? So everyone is kind of running to that finish line. And that right there is a trap in and of itself. Because that indicates that there is a, an attachment to the desire for change. You see it? Right. Because you're saying, I, I find the program less preferable than the lack of program. Therefore, you know, this is the state I want to function from. And I don't want to function from that state. Well, in one sense, is it true? Sure. And in one sense, is that a, a good truth to hold? Well, sure, because if it wasn't for even being in that state, you wouldn't be on your path the way you are. So it is that, um, you know, it's that burning drive that kind of gets you uh, to the place where you're actually going to do what needs to be done. Because, you know, it's kind of like it, you got to you got to show up. Right. <laughs> Just like anything in life. And I'm thinking about, you know, we held uh, satsang here physically in Charlotte prior to us beginning the radio program tonight. And if you look at the people who sign up to come, of course, you never get everyone who signs up. That's kind of normal. But tonight was a night where we had, uh, you know, down south in Charlotte, we had a really nasty rainstorm, uh, not atypical in the summertime. And, you know, probably about half the people who were planning on coming didn't come. And this is like, to me, a beautiful representation of you have to show up. You know, it's one thing to say you want the change. Yeah. But are you willing to put the effort in that's required to get to that place? Ultimately, there doesn't need to be change. But it's paradoxical because there does need to be change. Yeah. In order to experience the, um, you know, the, the lack of desire for change. It doesn't happen from a, a place of apathy, right? That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about all of a sudden you're in a space where you're like, oh, you know, I just kind of give up. I just, what's the use anymore? Who cares if anything changes or not? That's not what we're talking about. You have to be in that space where you desire change so desperately, really, that you're willing to do the uncomfortable, that you're willing to... Um, you know, to go in and question every thought that runs 
you know, every emotion that's felt, every state of mind that is witnessed. Um, it takes a great amount of effort. You do have to show up or you just won't get there. I mean, that's the bottom line of it. But there is a point at which even that alone is a limitation, right? Because then what, it, what is the identifier that's running? Well, one of them would be, you know, the, the consummate perpetual student. Yeah. And that was one that identif I identified with very strongly, very, very strongly. So I understand that one. Does it mean you stop being a student? No, no. But the identification with having to be the student drops. You can witness yourself as student. That's fine. I do, right? Witness myself as teacher. Witness myself as student. Why not? Of course. And aren't we all? In some capacity, we're all teachers. In some capacity, we're all students. Yeah, so why not identify with all of it? Beyond that, we wouldn't identify with any of it, really. But they're the same thing, too. You see that? Six of one, half dozen of the other, two sides of the same coin. Teacher and student on one side, neither on the other. But it's the same, right? Because if the attachment isn't there, what's the difference? Right? Does that have anything to do with what you just said to me? <laughs> I go off on these tangents. I really have no idea. Um, I'm trying, trying to remember what your quote was. It was about the Byron Katie thing. and Actually, you know, I figured out. I think that was actually from last week's. We need to talk about that this week. Oh, okay. Thank you, Majiki. So it's okay. Whatever. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. Okay. Um, Linda, I'm going to ask you. You looked a little emotional after, after our little clearing thing. Or is it, you have something else going on? Oh, she's sneezing. <laughs> so funny. I have to tell you, like, I have, um, I have earplugs in to do my program because I have to be able to hear PLA in. So I can't hear them in the room unless they're talking through the microphone. So all I saw was you grab a tissue. And I was like, wow, I wonder if you had like a profound experience. <laughs> but you know, you know, and I've told you many times that the Buddha has said, right, enlightenment can come at a sneeze. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. All right. Um, there was something, though, I believe during our session that I asked you to remind me to cover. Does anyone remember? Megan, you remember? Can you come and speak it for us? Remember we were talking and I said, ooh, I should do that on the radio tonight. Please remind me. It was... It was about, um, this is the personality, um, and getting, getting people to know that it's the personality running, but getting them to, um, like realize like while you're driving the car, that reaction that you just had, that's the personality. Like, is that helping? It was something about being, um, like a... <laughs> beginner with um... <laughs> <laughs> we have to start taking notes <laughs> you do the work long enough and your short term memory goes to pot so I'm just going to tell you that right off the bat so you have a whole group of people sitting here that we all sat through the same experience in the last hour and a half and no one can recall what I said <laughs> to remind me about mm hmm It was after that. It was towards the very end. And we had just walked nameless through the whole, um, because his experience was um, being in the car and getting upset at someone that was in the right lane. And we walked him through that whole thing where it was realizing the beliefs, the judgments, and then the unconscious beliefs underneath okay, so that. Let me just do that then. Okay. Let's let's just talk from that space because that's such a um it's such a necessary place to start to witness from anyway. Okay. So the first thing that I will um because it's coming to me right now kind of tell all of you is uh, especially if you have not been doing deep inner work for long 
and you happen to be listening, take yourself into meditation, okay, and ask from a very conscious place that the observer come into being for you, all right? The observer is part of the mind, and the observer is the, um, the portion of it that's capable of viewing from um, a place of non-attachment. It sees objectively. That's why we call it the objective observer. And it's incredibly necessary in the work in order to transcend the sense of the personal self the observer, what actually happens is the observer becomes stronger than the personal self and it overrides that program. Okay. So it can still witness the program, but the observer doesn't engage in the program. It can see it kind of like you watching a, a movie, right? And you can witness the movie and you can see all the stuff that's playing out. You can see things that the, that one character can't see because they're, they are the character but because you're stepped back and you're looking at the whole thing, you see things they don't see, right? You understand that? Okay, so that is the observer. And the observer, like you watching a movie, can watch the whole thing without being attached to it, right? It can see things that, um, you know, it could have compassion for. Like if you're watching a movie and you kind of, you know, you feel the emotion coming off of the actors and you find you're crying, that tears come, you know, the observer can witness that. That's not a big deal. At the end of the movie, you don't walk away attached to the story as if it's your own story, do you? Because you knew you were just observing the story. So your observer is that. And your observer is that for the personal story that you have carried thus far. Okay? So it is a, actually kind of a vital thing in the beginning to... Um, to consciously go in and ask that the observer come into being if, uh, if you haven't been doing this level of work. For those sitting here with me, that's not necessary. Um, so beyond that, let's take a look at, um, I want to get back to some of, the, some of the basics because along the way, I, I don't have a sense of how many people um, we have picked up as far as listening and it's always good to go back to some of the, the key um, kind of core principles that we function from here. Okay. One of the key things to keep in mind is that the personality itself is a program. Okay. It is what we call patterned consciousness. All right. Consciousness um, got itself, we're going to say stuck, um, stuck in a, a paradigm that it can't um, seem to find its way out of. You know that as third dimensional reality. And consciousness is certainly, um, well, consciousness is this third dimensional reality because what you are experiencing in your life, as I said last week, is, you know, it's a hologram, like you're a holodeck. That's literally what you're living in. You have the um, belief that's been programmed in that this is real. So when you feel like you have touched something with your hand, there's a sensation on the hand. So you believe that you actually touched something. And we all know from quantum physics at this point that that actually is not occurring, that there's always space. There's never anything, any one thing, never, ever, ever touches any other thing. That's just science. But yet it seems to feel very real. So what happens? Well, in the moment, you actually project that as the hand is falling toward the chair, you're projecting that within milliseconds, you're going to feel the solidity of the chair under your hand. It sends the impulse to the brain, right? The belief is attached to it. And then what does the brain send back? Well, it sends out the um, whatever it is that it sends to the nerve endings that tell you that pressure was just put on the hand. Yeah, and you feel it. This is why, like, we have people who, you know, if they lose an appendage, they have those, you know, phantom feelings in limbs that aren't there anymore. They'll swear that they can feel their leg, right? Well, because the program is still running up there that says the leg is still there. And whether there's a leg there or isn't there a leg there, they're going to feel it, okay? Because that's the power. The, the feeling is actually happening in the brain center. It's not happening in the appendage. It's not actually happening in your hand. It's happening in the brain, Okay. So the, what's happening is that your consciousness itself, because it got identified with um, this sense that it could be uh, singular, 
and singular outside of everything else, singular within a multiplicity. Does that make sense if I say it that way? Singular within a multiplicity, meaning that there is a me and there is a you, 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 and you. Okay? That's polarity, right? Remember, you're individuated but not separated. And in highest truth, where, where you actually live and have your, your essence, that is your truth, that there is an individuation here, that God presents itself in a unique way here, but that it's all God, right? So there is no me within it. It's just an aspect of the one. That's the reality that, that you actually live by, that that's your truth that you're knowing. That is what you are. Here, consciousness has identified with being me and you being you, and we're very different people, aren't we? You like purple and I like green, right? You like the Mets and I like the Yankees, and never the twain shall meet, right? You like, uh, you know, pasta and I like steak, so we can't go out to eat. (laughs) <laughs> and agree on a place and see and so this dynamic keeps the whole thing in place because everywhere we look it's always something opposing us it's always something opposing us well consciousness has been patterned into this matrix of of this sense of an individual self and this individual self was created out of a state where it felt it had been wronged okay Kind of in a double way, it felt that it had been wronged and it felt that it had done wrong, both simultaneously. So if you take it back to the initial um, a moment, bad word, but it's really the only one I can use, the initial moment of separation, in that moment, consciousness would have experienced, you know, this, like the story of the Garden of Eden, that it had been expelled. Okay. And there would have been confusion about that. Like, what, why? What happened? And then after the why and what happened, it would sense this feeling of guilt, just like Adam and Eve recognizing all of a sudden they were naked and feeling shame and feeling like they had to cover, right? So you have this, your consciousness experienced the same thing, except the shame is not being naked a great metaphor but in reality the shame is what did I do wrong what did I do that got me kicked out in the first place and what and wow like what did I do that I can't get back because that is the reality of what consciousness experienced was the desire to return but not being able to actually get back to that space okay so yeah go ahead come on over and ask Is there a difference between when you say, what did I do wrong, and then saying, I did something wrong? Do you know what I mean? One is questioning yourself, and then the other is assuming that you had to have done something wrong. Show me me where the assumption does not um, show up in both of them. I guess I'm not sure, to be honest. But I think where my question is coming from um, is if there's a, a, a difference in where you, where consciousness is sitting, if you say or ask, what did I do wrong? That's shame. What did I do wrong? Versus like knowing that you had to have done something wrong for you to be in this position. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So recognizing first that it's all coming from the same story, right? Certainly. Um, but yeah, the, there's, a, there's a level of innocence in the first question that says, what did I do wrong? But within it is the assumption that I've done something wrong because without the assumption that you've done something wrong, the question of what did I do wrong or did I do something wrong wouldn't come. You see? It's subtle. I'm trying to sit in that space because I've witness myself saying both yes yeah so you'll have um okay so here's the the shame comes before the question 
So we'll take this to a child. This is good for a child. Linda, you'll see this a lot because you spend a lot of time with small kids. So a kid can have an experience where they will get some kind of um, signal from the caregiver that something wasn't, it can just be a look, a little nod of the head, right? And the child will go, well, what did I do wrong? And underneath it is there's an assumption that's already being made that I've done something wrong. Without the assumption, I could look at you and you could be shaking your head and it wouldn't mean anything to me. The shaking of the head has no meaning in and of itself, does it? It only has the meaning that we have given it. Yeah. So the question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Right. And then, of course, to say, I've done something wrong. Yes, you're owning it. You're absolutely owning it. And you can see that you have done something wrong. But the assumption that something wrong has been done is there in both of them to varying degrees. Yeah. It, se it seems, um, hmm, what's the word? More palatable to the ego to be in the space of, did I do something wrong? <laughs> right? Then to say, oh, I did something wrong. <laughs> because to sit in the, in the ladder means I have to actually look at it. I have to recognize it. I have to own it. And ego does not like to do that, certainly. So you'll see a lot of people who actually will function a lot of the time in the questioning place. Oh, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? You know, it's saying, oh, let me fix it. Let me make it better. Right. But the fact is they already own that they've done something wrong or they wouldn't be questioning it and they wouldn't be looking for a way to fix it. They're already owning it. They just are in denial that they're owning it. Yeah. You look like you get that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the program that happens with, um, with the lower mind, it's, it's so all pervasive the the observer, you know, it's very, it's non-existent in most people right now. Now, they'll have a certain level of observer, at least as far as looking out in the world in general, okay? Because, you know, there's an observer in everybody that's capable of, of being objective when it comes to some things in almost everybody. Because there are some things you really just don't have a personal opinion about. So you could look at two sides of an issue and be like, oh, yeah, like I see their side and I see their side. Like, and I don't really, I don't attach to either one of them because it has nothing to do with me, nothing to do with my life, right? So, and that is the observer, all right? And so it's good to kind of witness that you already have that to a certain degree. But now what we're, what we're needing is we're needing for that observer to start looking at home, right, with the personal story, that is very attached to everything that its beliefs surround. And until that observer starts to work its muscles, um, the program just continues to run and continues to amp up. Because for people, especially at this time, as things continue to shift and change, and I mean, there's just so much going on on so many different levels that you aren't even aware of, but it doesn't mean that you're exempt from what's happening, okay? Because you exist on all of those levels. So you're experiencing shifting occurring within the multidimensionality of what you are. You're already experiencing it. And so everyone on the planet is, whether they are showing up for this kind of teaching or whether they're just living their life and they have nothing to do with quote-unquote spirituality at all, they are still walking it just as everyone is. And the beautiful thing is that those who walk it consciously are actually functioning in a capacity of service for those who won't walk it consciously. And it is an act of service, you know. And, and I like to kind of look at it. You can take it to the story of the Christ because people are so familiar with that story, you know. It's not... Uh, and I always laugh to myself about the um, how attached the Christian community is to the whole Jesus on the cross thing, you know. And I always kind of like think to myself, you know, Sananda, 
up there going probably like laughing like you know it's not that big of a deal <laughs> you know it never was that wasn't the point you're all so attached to the the tragedy of the whole thing like let it go <laughs> you know because that's why he did what he did he came to show what could be and without an attachment to it I and mean, you have to remember in the story he came forward of his own accord he knew what was going to happen to him you know, he walked forward, gave himself up. He wasn't running from anybody. Knowing what he was walking into, how many people today would do the same thing, right? Nailed to a cross, left to die. I mean, it's a pretty, if you've done any research on what happens to the physical body when it's crucified, it's not a pleasant thing, right? But that's, but it wasn't the point for him. He wasn't the body. He knew, he knew at that point he wasn't the body. He could detach from the body. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. Right? And actually, it's very interesting. As a little aside. If you look into the Hebrew, there's the one line that is attributed to Jesus saying, you know, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? He never actually spoke those words. If you look back to the original text, not even that you'd know anyway, because it was written so much later than when he actually lived. I mean, you know, we have to keep that in mind, too. All right. So if you look at uh, the figure such as the Christ, like that is what all of you in your own way are doing in your own way. It's not any different. Just because you don't have multitudes of people following you to listen to what you have to say does not mean that you aren't giving the same level of service because you are. You are consciously walking the walk because there are those who won't. And you're doing it and you're walking through the difficulty of this walk. This is not an easy walk. And all of you in this room with me will attest to that. Right? And it seems more difficult for some than for others, but it's difficult for everyone. And this is, this is one little piece that I get. Um, it's all about your perspective, isn't it? Because what is, you know, devastating to one person Another person would look at and wouldn't think of that as devastating. Well, does it make it less devastating for the person who's experiencing it as devastating? No, it doesn't. So anyone who sits in the place and says, well, you don't understand what it is to be me. I don't, you know, you have this and you say this, but you don't really understand. It doesn't matter. Misery is misery, right? You've set yourself up for your own level of misery. It is yours and you own it. It doesn't make it more miserable than someone else's misery. It doesn't make it less miserable than someone else's misery. Because what they have chosen for their misery is specifically chosen for them, by them, because it needs to be experienced. And they will live it to the same depth that you will live it. It doesn't matter what it looks like in the outside world. It's the same thing, right? So everyone has their own challenges. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, all of you sitting with me today and I would make the assumption that all of you listening to me, whether right now or later on an archive, you know, you've stepped up to live your misery so that there are those who won't have to. And it's an incredible act of service. Now, does it mean that people, there, there are people out there who don't have to do their work? No, it doesn't mean that because they are doing their work. But there are those who won't walk it consciously the way you're walking it. And you're enabling them to not have to go into the depths that you've had to go into. And you do that from a place of compassion. Yeah. Just like people who do, you know, transmutation work for the collective. Right. You go into that space. Offering yourself as a vessel for all of humanity and whatever needs to run will run and you get to feel it all. Right. Right. Is it pleasant? Well, I mean, who's attached to it being pleasant or unpleasant? It just is what it is. It's a whole bunch of energy. <laughs> and it moves, and it can make you feel sick, and it can make you cry like crazy, and it can give you pain in the heart and the whole bit, right? But at the end, it's done, and it's over, and you move on. And that's what we're all doing here. And that's the beauty of the observer. The observer allows you to consciously take this journey and to go in and dissect the personality, you know, where consciousness got patterned and it turned into a personality. And now 
you can go in and pick it apart like uh, dissecting a frog in biology class. Ooh, what's that piece, you know? Check that out. Cool. <laughs> and the observer can do that with the story of the personal self. The personal self can't do that. It's, it's too threatened, right? I can't look that deeply. I can't dissect that piece because I don't like what's sitting there. There was a thing that someone quoted on Facebook. I think it was on the Shambhala Center page. It was a Panache Desai quote, something about um, your saboteur. Do you remember what that was? Yes. Do I remember exactly what it was? No, but he basically was saying that um, you set yourself up to sabotage yourself. Yeah, and and that's exactly it. And so from the place of the personal self, would you ever see it? So for the person who, and and this is, I'll use this because it's the it's such a common example. We'll take a single woman who never has a good relationship. And she'll be talking to her girlfriends and be like, I swear to God, <laughs> the next guy I date will not be like him. I swear to you. Like, I'm going to look the exact opposite direction. And ultimately, what does she end up doing? She ends up finding someone exactly like the other guy, right? And that's like, it's so common. It's comical. It's so common. We all know it's the truth. We all do. And how many movies does it show up in? And you know what I mean? How many stories does it show up in? Well, because it's the pattern. Now, to say to a woman who has, you know, been living the same relationship over and over again with different faces attached to it, you know, you're doing this to yourself and you're sabotaging yourself on purpose. She'd tell you you're crazy, right? Why would I, why would I do that to myself? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Of course I wouldn't do that to myself. You're telling me I'm purposely picking the wrong person for me because I need to feel whatever victimized will say and I could say absolutely <laughs> and she'd say you're crazy now get this person to do the work with me and within a month I'll get you in the room with me and I'll say the same thing to her and she'll go oh my god you're absolutely right oh my gosh like, like I never would have seen it before but there it is you can't you can't not see it once the observer is there the observer sees all of it the observer sees what the personal self is holding on to so strongly, and the observer sees what the personal self is trying to push away so strongly. You know, it's in denial over it. It's that unconscious side. The observer gets to witness all of it, the unconscious and the conscious side, when it's strong, right? And there's no story there. So if the observer sees it, now it's almost like a game. Oh, that's we're back to the dissecting the frog thing, right? Once you get over your squeamishness, <laughs> at that point, it's just kind of interesting. It's fascinating. It's fascinating, the inner workings of the personal self. Oh, look at that. Look at, look at what I just did. Of course, it's not I that did it. It's the program. You know? And if everyone started talking that way, wouldn't that be lovely? Oh, look at what the program just did. <laughs> watching a movie and uh, I was watching a movie and um, I, I honestly can't remember the name of the movie and I don't want to give too much away about it anyway because I don't know for me it was so good but anyway um, I was so into the movie uh, and I, towards the end of the movie there was a point where um the main character, his fiance died. And that, like, that came in a left field. Like, I never would have um, expected that. So when <clears throat> it, like, came to the realization for, you know, whoever's watched the movie, that the fiance actually died, I literally <laughs> witnessed myself. And I didn't witness it until a little bit afterwards. But I felt my hand go in front of my mouth and I went, Oh God. And the tears came. And then it was like another part of Megan 
came in and realized what just happened. And it was such a weird experience for me because I said to myself, is this me witnessing what happens in everyday life with Megan where it's this automatic thing? Like the movie is the actual program. The movie would be Megan living her life and I'm this inanimate object or something like a puppet and my hand moves in front of my mouth and an emotion comes and then the observer is like, oh, wow, I just put my hand in front of my mouth. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it was like this whole orchestrated thing, but it felt so weird to me and I, and it stuck with me because I f- feel like there's something in that for me to see because... um it was such a different experience for me and it just felt like um, like I wasn't even the body. Like I wasn't anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm... Yeah, no, that's excellent. Um, and I've had a very similar experience, so I'll share mine because there is something to be seen there. I was watching, um, I think it was just the movie Anne Boleyn. That's the one that was, what's the actress who played Anne Boleyn? Uh, uh, Natalie Portman. Natalie Portman. Yeah, it, it was her. And I was watching that movie and the scene where she gets beheaded came on. And it was so profound for me. This was, I don't, gosh, maybe three years ago. I was sitting there on the couch. My husband was next to me. We're watching this movie. And she's standing there. And she removed her necklace and she was standing there and you could watch her hands. I mean, she was just shaking, right? The body, of course, went into its primal state of fear about the inevitable. But she was very resolute, you know, scared to death, but but resolute that she was going down, you know, from a strong place, I guess. And as I watched it, I literally witnessed the energy that was that story come into my energy fields and literally come up through my physical form and out my eyes because I just, just tears just started streaming and there was no, I had no attachment whatsoever to the story. It was literally just being witnessed that, Oh my God, like like that's the energy because what's going on here is that the energy of what the collective has attached to death is running. That's what the movie brought out, right? So remember that thought forms, they're just energy fields. They're energy fields that we have attached words to and concepts to, but it's just an energy field. And so what I witnessed there was the energy field of death. Yeah. And it brought this immediate state of, I mean, it was this huge wave of, it was like almost like a hot energy that just came up and through me and then just tears just started streaming. There was no story, no personal story, right? And it was just like, oh, that's it. Like the collective has chosen that for this particular energy, what needs to be associated with it is pain and sadness, right? And grief. And so that's what literally ran through the body as it got presented with it coming off of a TV screen, right? But it's the same thing when you're, when you're out in public and you're around people and the energy field is attached to whatever the story is and you come into contact with it. And that's why I say you, you walk into other people's realities because you're now you're walking in. If they're sitting there in tears, you could very easily find yourself crying. Why? Because you, you just walked into that energy field and the collective is holding it as such a thing, and you'll find it just, there it is, boom. But it's not you, right? It's just, the, it's just consciousness running the pattern, running that program. The col- Remember, you're still, you are still attached to the collective, right? This body is attached to the collective consciousness, and it feels the energy fields. Now, so, so who's, who's the crier? Exactly. That's right. That's right. That, that's why it was so unique to me because I was like, who just did this? Yeah. Did that? and then- <laughs> that's right. That's right. 
And that's the beauty of a really strong observer is it can actually witness all that and then never attach to it. Because the only thing that happened was consciousness was presented with this energy field and it ran and that's it. I mean, that's it. There's no other story than that. Yeah. It's a profound experience to have because it, and it changes you. And th- this is a, and Megan, I'm glad that you did bring it forward because these are the moments on, on your journey for every one of you. That's why I always say, write things down because you forget these moments. But when you write them down and you go back and look, it'll be, it'll be just as if you are reliving it. I don't know what it is that the energy kind of gets put into the the writing of it because literally when you go back into what you've written, it's literally as if you're in that space all over again, very fresh. I mean, I'll go back and read journals from eight years ago where I was writing down specific um, like dream sequences and you would think after eight years, I mean, you know how fleeting dreams are anyway, right? And you'd think after eight years that even reading it, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I vaguely remember that. Uh uh-uh. uh. I mean, if I read my words, it's like, boom, you know, I can see it as if it was yesterday. So write your experiences down. But this is like one of those beautiful experiences because it is, um, it shows there's a specific state of consciousness that is capable of experiencing that experience. And that's what you're being, that's what it shows you. And that's the gift in it. That's where grace is such a beautiful thing because you have this experience and you're like, oh my gosh. And then you recognize, oh, like there's progress in that, right? And so for the, you know, the limited personal self that wants to know, am I on the right path? Am I moving in the right direction? Yes, you just were shown that and you were shown it so clearly, right? That's exactly what that shows you. So it's important when you have those and it's really important to share them with your guide (laughs) so your guide knows as well too okay so back to just the whole um, importance of the observer and witnessing what's going on the the biggest um, hurdle in the beginning is just to be open enough humble enough and willing enough to begin to allow yourself to see the identified you from a different lens, okay? So right now, just recognize that everyone is so invested in their own personal story that they feel just the concept of having to look deeper is threatening. And because it's threatening, we want to run from it. And a lot of people will experience, like when they very first start working with me, they'll feel sick, They'll have many, I'll have a, a lot of people, you know, in, in the past when I always worked out of my house, you know, people kind of show up and they're like, you have no idea how close I came to not coming today. And I'm like, no, I know. <laughs> I definitely know because it's like the ego is going, oh, no, 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 no. And the reason it says no, no, no is because yes, 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 it's exactly what you need to be doing, right? So if you even in listening to the program, if you feel resistance, just know that's a very natural part of coming into the space of someone who can bring truth. Okay, because the ego feels very threatened in that space initially. Okay, and even down the road, you know, it goes in waves later. Initially, it can be a big hurdle. And that's how you, you know, so we've gone full circle because now we're back to the whole, you know, showing up thing. Because those are the people who really will move um, and shift huge amounts in this lifetime are those who, even though, there is a challenge in front of them, whether it be the weather or just the voice inside the head that says you don't want to go today. Okay. It's the same thing. Remember the external world is just the projection of the internal world, right? So for people tonight, their internal world projected out to the rain and it was like, no, that's the perfect reason not to go. And for someone else, maybe they actually felt it inside and it was the voice that said, oh, I don't know about that, right? Okay. But, you know, if you really are serious about making great strides in this lifetime, then you have to show up. You have to, you know, take the extra step, walk the extra mile, be uncomfortable. You know, it's like trying to teach my 13-year-old son that it's, it's worth it to spend the, the next two hours mowing that lawn you've got a $20 payoff at the end. So rather than griping about it, look forward to the $20 payoff, do the work, 
right? It's no different. So that's what I'm saying to all of you. Do the work because the payoff is more than worth it. And right now, for this time, it may feel uncomfortable and you may feel sweaty and hot and miserable, <laughs> but it's worth it at the end of the day. And I think that's a good place to leave it, don't you? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we will go into meditation and we will see you again next Thursday. Um, my deepest, deepest love and gratitude to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and we will see you next week. Goodbye.
You are divine.